Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hello. Oh my gosh, we're still filling up, you guys. Hi, guys. Good evening. How are you all? Everyone doing good? Having a nice Tuesday night? Hi, guys. Okay, amazing. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. I see we have almost 400 of you guys with us. And it's still climbing. Uh, I'm sorry for the late start. Those were technical difficulties on my end, as tends to happen when you most don't want them to happen. But I'm happy to have you all here with me, and I don't want to lose any more time. So I'm going to jump us right into the presentation. For those who it's your first time here, marhaba bikum. This is our English for Specific Purposes class that we have every Tuesday night. My name is Ariella Knight. I will be your teacher tonight. And today we have a special guest interview as well. So I'm so excited to have you guys both for the first half with me and then the second half with our guest. All right, so I am gonna explain everything about how this class works. But in order to do all of that, I'm going to share my presentation. Okay, my presentation, let's do this. All right, tell me you guys, can you see it? Do you see the PowerPoint? Yes, woohoo, okay, very cool. All right, you guys, so welcome to English for Specific Purposes week two. There are 10 weeks total. And just so you guys know, we have a ton of registrars for this class. We have, or I should say registrations. We have almost 27,000 people who are receiving the links to join. We have almost 500 actually in the class right now. Um, the ones who are here, I'm so excited to have you. You get to participate in the live class, in the interactions. For those watching this later on YouTube, join us next Tuesday for the live opportunity. And uh, I still think there's a good benefit to watching it afterwards and getting the learning. Hello, everyone. I love saying hi. Okay. Me, who am I? My name is Ariella. I am the founder and the CEO of the American Institute. We are an English school and a cultural ex exchange center based in Algiers, but with classes online. So actually we have students and teachers everywhere around the world. Me, I am an American. I was born in Boston. I went to school in Colorado and then in Washington, DC. And now I currently live in Algiers full time. My uh, background is in program management, business consulting, and of course, in teaching English. Yalla, we're going to keep going so we don't spend forever on the intro. So for those who are here for the first time and you're wondering, how does this work? What do you mean you have a weekly class? What does that look like? Here are the details. We have this class online every Tuesday evening. It is from 6.30 to 8 p.m. That is Algiers time zone. We have 10 weeks of classes, so that means there's 10 sessions total. It is free to attend, okay? There are uh, 500 spots. So right now we actually have 483 people in the room with us, which is blowing my mind. Um, we're usually almost full, if not past full. So I always recommend you sign in early so that you can get to the spot or that you can claim your spot. Um, but luckily, the classes are recorded and posted on YouTube afterwards. All right, this is the program. So the first week was just an introduction class, and we started talking about English for Tourism. 
This week, we are continuing English for Tourism, and I'm very excited because we'll be doing some skill building, some scenarios and uh, opportunities for participation. After this, we have English for Health and Medicine. We have English for Media, Social Media, Humor, Beauty, Cooking, and then a topic open for you guys to tell me what you think, okay? What you want to learn, what specific English you would like to focus on. All right, a few reminders before we start. This is an advanced intermediate level class. If I am talking too fast, if you don't understand, it could be that your level is slightly low. You can join, but I will not be slowing down the class, okay? So I recommend you plan to rewatch the YouTube afterwards. The classes will run like this. Every week we have a different topic. Classes will, will be a combination of vocabulary, skill building, and guest interviews. So a big focus of this series are that are all of us, you guys and myself, will have a chance to talk to guests about their experiences in that field. Um, at specific points, I will invite you to come and participate in the chat or via microphone. Uh, participation is highly, highly encouraged. So how to use the chat. I don't think I need to tell you guys how to use the chat because I see you in there typing away, chat, chat, chat. Please uh, feel free to ask questions related to the topic, encourage each other. Because I'm speaking to you, I may not see everything that comes through, okay? So I'm not reading it as I present, but at specific moments I will check and try to find uh, questions or anything in there. How to use the Q&A. So you actually have a question and answer section of this. Uh, it's sometimes called Q&R if you're in the French Zoom. This is where you can ask specific questions and I'll go in there every so often to see what people are asking. There are two questions we get all the time. Number one, does the class have a certificate? And the answer is no. There is no certificate for the class. It's free to attend. It's open for everyone. We don't track who comes, so we can't certify you. Number two, yes, the class is recorded and you can view it later. I did see some questions about where, where do we view it? You can view this on the U.S. Embassy's YouTube page. That's U.S. Embassy Algiers. You can also view it at the American Institute YouTube page. We post it twice. I will send you guys, um, uh, afterwards I have all your emails, I'll send you a link to the class so you can view it after. I know I'm talking quickly now because I want to get to the class. Um, oh, we often uh, ask you guys to participate with a microphone. That means you actually get to speak and share on audio. I ask you to only speak if you have a good connection, because if you don't have a good connection, we lose some time waiting to see if someone will talk. Uh, and please stay brief when you're speaking so that many people have a chance to share. Class rules, okay, respect and civility in the chat. If I see people being disrespectful in the chat, saying not nice things, either to me or to each other, I may have to kick you out of the class. So let's be respectful. Be nice, be kind. We're only together for an hour and a half. Why not be nice and kind? No swearing, that's no profanity, no discussing uh, anything irrelevant. We're here to focus today on English for tourism. That's all we will talk about. And then let's have fun. Okay, is everyone okay? I'm gonna look at the chat. I'm gonna look at the Q&A before we move forward. The puppy lady, <laughs> I know. I always have the same puppies, you guys. I'm sorry, I get lazy. If you have other uh, animals, animal pictures, please send them to me and I will try to change up my slides. Hello, everyone, okay? I see everyone saying nice to meet you. People are saying hi. All oh, good in the hood. Thank you, Hamza. Okay, cool. So let's talk about the agenda today. We're just gonna go ahead and get started. So today is Tourism English. And I say two because we did Tourism English last week and we will continue it today. But what's very exciting today is we have an interview with uh, uh, 
an amazing Algerian traveler named Noor Brahimi. And Noor Brahimi will come and join us for the second half of the class, okay? So she will come around 7.15, 7.20, and then we'll do an interview. So before that, we do class. After that, we do an interview. We are going to review some vocabulary. We are going to focus on skill building. Then we'll do interview and our idiom of the week. It's another dog. <laughs> I know it's the same dogs as last week, but I see these every week and they make me laugh and smile. It's a dog in a mini plane. <laughs> He's so cute. Okay. So tourism English. For those who were here last week, I say, you know, I just thank you for your patience of going over it again because it's a little review for everyone who's new. So tourism English, what does it mean, tourism English? So tourism English is different from regular English in two ways. Number one, it is simpler and more direct. This is because there are many non-native English speakers, okay? So when you have a tourist from Turkey speaking uh, to a hotel receptionist in France, they may be using English, but neither of them uh, have the same base language. So you want to go for simple sentences, simple verbs, simple grammar. Even native English speakers speak more simply when they're speaking to a non-native speaker. So you'll find tourism English can be more direct than regular English and simpler. However, it is also more polite, okay? Because when we speak about tourism English, we're talking about what we call the hospitality industry. Hospitality, okay? That includes anything having to do with service. So a hotel where people can stay or a restaurant where you come and eat. These are uh, different businesses that we refer to as the hospitality industry. And in these industries, they are very customer service focused. So the English that you need to master if you're working in these places or if you are going to them as a tourist is more polite than you would use in other scenarios. Tourism English, tourism vocabulary is vast, okay? We, when we talk about tourism vocabulary, we talk about two different types of people who use it. So we have tourists. Tourists themselves need tourism vocabulary for traveling. So that includes airport vocabulary. It also includes travel problems, okay? And travel vocabulary, missing a flight, losing a bag. We have uh, hotel vocabulary, checking in, um, getting a maid service, what we call turn down service. There's many specific hotel words. And then booking, everything related to making reservations, whether it's with a tour and a tour guide, hotel or flights. When we talk about tours in English, we are also talking about uh, people who work with tourists. So you may be someone who needs tourism English, not because you're a traveler, but because you work in a hotel in your hometown. So you are working with tourists, okay? So for people who work with tourists, we're mostly talking about hotel staff, restaurant workers, and tour guide companies. I see a question in the chat. Someone says, what does it mean booking? When we say booking a tour, who can answer that question? What does it mean to book a tour? Book a tour, book hotels, book flights. Reserve, very good. To book means to reserve or to make a reservation. We actually, this is a side, little side story uh, about British versus American English. But in American English, we say book. You book a tour, you book a hotel room, you book a flight. In British English, they also use book, but sometimes they say hire, okay? You hire a hotel room, which in American English, we would never say that you hire a room. Uh, but actually, we would say you hire a tour guide. So those are the words you'd hear in these scenarios, book, reserve, and hire, okay? I know, you know, I learned this the hard way because I'm American, I know American English, and I corrected a student who said, I want to hire a room. And I said, no, no, 
we hire a tour guide, we book a room. And he emailed me later with a link to an article saying, actually, in British English, you hire a room. So that was very humbling for me as a teacher to realize, as an American, I don't know everything in British English. Okay, chalas, we continue. Okay, for everyone who was here last week, we did an exercise really focused on what we call collocations. Collocations is just a fancy word for vocabulary, two or more vocabulary words that come together. I'm not going to go through all of these because we just don't have enough time, but I wanted to show you if you were not here last week so you can take a picture. A collocation is just a common pairing of words, okay? So for example, number five, boost tourism. Okay, boost tourism is a collocation. We use this phrase more commonly than increase tourism. Okay, collocation just means it's two words that we love to put together. We use more commonly. So for you guys who were here last week, you'll recognize all of this. I think we got through all of them, even up to 20, take a red eye, 21, travel agent, 22, weekend getaway, okay? But I wanted to put this here so that you guys can take a picture if you weren't here last week. And I recommend you watch the recording because these are very common phrases, okay? We are gonna go right into tourism English skill development because I have two activities I want to get through. I know I'm moving fast, but all of this was introduction or review. Now we're on to new material. So first we're going to talk about softeners. Softeners, okay? This is another way of saying polite English. So quickly, why are we talking about politeness when we're talking about tourism? Well, being polite is a necessary part of tourism English for tourists and for hospitality workers. English speaking cultures often have very, very high customer service expectations, okay? We expect to have a good customer service culture. Professionals interacting with tourists will need a high level of politeness to get and keep their business. So even if your culture does not have strong customer service, if you have an English speaker who arrives, they might expect that you are responsive, that you are polite, that you know how to phrase things nicely, okay? So it can become very important. And last, tourists are expected to be polite when asking questions and making requests in English. Sometimes when you translate a question from another language into English, you would um, possibly in English, you would not sound polite. It is not always appropriate to do a direct translation. Okay, so this is what we will practice today is how to make our uh, sentences, our questions, our phrases more polite in tourism scenarios. There's something interesting about this. English is known as the language of efficiency, right? We speak quickly, we get to the point. This is because we don't use very many adjectives or adverbs, okay? We're not very descriptive. We don't have a lot of what we call flowery language. However, in a polite scenario, in a formal scenario, we actually do the opposite. We have longer phrases and we soften them with additional words, okay? Because in order to be more polite in English, you need to be slightly less direct. Instead of, I want that table, imagine I'm in a restaurant, I want that table, we say, I would love that table if possible, okay? We make the sentence longer and we soften our request to be less direct. 
All right, I saw someone in the chat talking about um, uh, avoiding intercultural misunderstanding. Exactly. English, in, in a tourism context, there is a level of politeness that is expected. So that's why we're focusing on it today, so that you can master this element of tourism English and not offend anyone, which often is happening unintentionally. Uh, I have this, this uh, short cut that I like to tell my students, which is that when you are more indirect, you are more polite, okay? When you say directly, I want that table, that's very, very direct, and it comes across as very impolite. To say, I would like that table, if possible, it's less direct. Okay, you've introduced a bit of a question. Uh, is it even possible I could sit there? It's heard as more polite. The person listening, know, they know you want the table, but they feel they have been respected. So I actually saw someone asking in the chat, what is a softener? And I want to ask you this. I've been using the phrase to soften, or a softener, I want you to tell me, what do you think I mean by that? Those who attended the business English class with me might have some ideas already. Softener, okay, I see someone saying to, me, to be more polite, to make your tone softer, to be more friendly, okay? Easier English, soft, politeness, saying things politely. Softener is more soft, exactly. Softeners are some words that you use to make something more polite, not aggressive, mm -hmm, more kind, very good, high hospitality, okay, to seem, to make it more polite using a soft voice, interesting, not rude, being respectful, okay. I saw someone said informal, someone else said formal. So let's see what it is exactly. Softeners are additional words that make sentences less direct. Common softeners are a bit, around, kind of, ish, a few, quite, slightly, a little, Okay, they help to make our request, uh, as you guys said, more polite and less direct. So an example I put here is someone says, it's too late to find a good restaurant for dinner. A softened way to say the sentence is, it may be a bit too late to find a good restaurant for dinner, okay? making it less assertive, less aggressive. These are all used in polite or formal scenarios. Okay, someone's asking an example for ish. So the example I usually give for ish is actually about timing. When you say to someone, I want to have lunch at 12 tomorrow. It's very direct, it's very assertive, it's not very polite. A more polite way to say this, well, I suggest making it a question saying, are you free for lunch at 12-ish tomorrow? You can also say around 12, okay? It's, it's interesting because I know when I hear the question, I know that you want to have lunch at 12. I, I don't think you're confused but you're leaving it open in case 12 is too early for me. I could say uh, around 12, maybe 1230-ish. Is that okay? And they say, okay, all right. So ish is a way of saying not exactly. If I say to you, I'm, I'm sleepy-ish, it means I'm, a, I'm kind of sleepy. I'm not exactly. Uh, I'm a little sleepy. I'm kind of, it's not the right word. Okay, so when we use it with time, I'm saying let's meet around 12. Let's meet at 12-ish. 
Okay, not exactly 12, but in, in the realm. The first time you guys hear about ish. I love that sentence. Okay, well, I hope it's interesting. Really think of ish as a synonym for around. Um, another example I'll give for ish is if you say, uh, maybe someone is, is trying to do an event and they come, they, they come to your restaurant. They say, how many people can I invite to the event? How many people can fit in your restaurant? You go, mm, it fits 20-ish people, maybe 21, maybe 19, maybe 22, okay? It's a way of softening. It's not an exact science, okay? Because people, we're not an exact science. You can add a chair. Maybe they're all really big. It's less than uh, 20. Maybe some of them are children. It's more. Okay, so that's the ish. That's how the ish works. <laughs> okay, amazing. So guys, now we're going to start talking, uh, doing scenarios together. Uh, other, oh, sorry, before, before we get to scenarios, uh, what I focused on in the last slide was these filler words slightly about ish, okay? But there's other important ways to make your sentences more uh, polite as well. So using a negative question, like, uh, don't you think uh, we should meet around one tomorrow? Okay, that's a, a very polite way. What I'm actually doing is suggesting one. I don't sound like it, but I'm making a suggestion. Okay. Another way to make, uh, to make your sentence more polite is to avoid the present simple. Instead of, I want that table, you'd say, I was wondering if that table is free. I was wondering if we can go to that table, okay? Avoiding that direct present simple. And then using modal verbs, would, could, may, might. Instead of, uh, uh, will you be free tomorrow? You could say, would you be free tomorrow for a call? Okay, that's a very simple way to make your phrases more polite, easy to add to your vocabulary, but they will make a very big difference for the person listening. Now we're playing our game. Let me check the time. Okay, so uh, the game is called Soften This. So I am going to give you a very direct statement and I want you to tell me a softer way to do it. This we are going to do through chat. So please chat to me, okay, the answers or your suggested answer. There's no right answer, so send anything in. Okay, number one, can I have more water? How can we say this softer? or more politely, can I have more water? May I have more water, I see. Could I, good, could I have, I would like to have. Would you please give me, you guys are so good. Look how many of you are participating, I love it. I would love to have water, may I have water? Would you please give me some water? Could I, I'd love to, could I have, could I, could I? Okay, good, is it okay if I, mm -hmm. okay, I would like to have, could I have, may I have, I was wondering, good, someone used wondering, awesome. Avoiding that, um, that uh, direct present simple, very cool. Would you mind? Could I have? Okay, let me show you what I put. May I have? Good. So a lot of you said, may I have and could I have? So that was perfect. But something that you could have added to make it even more polite is a softener or a filler word. May I have a little more water? May I have a little more water? Okay, just to be clear. This does not mean you only want a little more water. It is just a more polite way to ask for it by adding that softened word, okay? And the same with the next sentence. Could I have some more water? Could I have some more water? Okay, these little words will make your sentences more polite, all right? 
by by softer i saw someone say they're still a little confused what i mean when i say softer i mean less direct it feels less assertive okay all right everyone let's try number two soften this where is the toilet how can i say this more politely I see someone said, oh, good, Cowther, I was wondering. Good, I love you guys using I was wondering. Can I use, I was wondering, could you please show me? I beg your pardon. There's a trick in here, you guys. I've tricked you. Think about American English. And I want you to think of a more polite vocabulary word. Yes, I saw someone use it. Can you show me the? Bathroom, please. Very good, bathroom. It's a bit of a trick, but it's also just interesting because in, uh, in the US, the toilet and the bathroom do not mean the same thing. Can you show me where is the bathroom? The restroom, good, someone said restroom. That's also perfect. Can you, please, I see people saying, please, would you? Oh, I love someone says, I'm sorry, I'm a bit lost. Can you show me the bathroom? I, I'm, as soon as I saw that phrase, I see a very polite person just in the hotel. Excuse me. Can you, could you please? Okay, very good, you guys. Here are the ones I put. Number one, is it possible to use the bathroom here? Okay. This is the kind of question you would ask someone if you're at a restaurant, maybe at a coffee shop. Is it possible to use the bathroom? Even though you are not saying, I need the bathroom, the understanding is that you need it. Why would you ask if it's possible if you don't need it, right? So sometimes asking about the possibility of a bathroom is a polite way to say, I'd really like to use the restroom, okay? But it's it's less direct, it's more polite. Is it possible to use the bathroom here? Okay. And then where might I find the bathroom? Okay, you can see I said might, I went for a modal uh, verb here. And uh, where might I find instead of use and bathroom instead of toilet? Do you guys know what we in English in American English when someone says toilet? Why is toilet different than bathroom? What's the difference? Uh, Sal, yes, and yes, you can say, I was wondering if you can show me the bathroom. Okay, what is the toilet versus bathroom? No, nope, not yet. I've seen some answers, but they're not, they're not correct. Toilet is the seat. Mm. Bathroom, you can wash the hands. There's a sink, bathroom as a shower. Toilet is in the bathroom. That's the most correct. Yes, Miriam, the bathroom is the room that contains the toilet. There is only toilet in toilet. No, that is the common misunderstanding. So, and I should say, if you are traveling in much of the world, when you ask for the toilet, everyone knows what you mean. There will be no confusion. But since we're in, in an English class, I thought I would let you know that the toilet in English is actually the single machine, the single object that you sit on. That's the toilet. The room is not the toilet. The room is the bathroom. If the toilet, sorry, if the toilet, if the room has a toilet, it is still a bathroom, even if there is no bath. It does not need a bath, it does not need a shower, it does not need a sink. If there is a toilet with a door, that is considered a bathroom. Okay, there's, uh, there's part, uh, there's other words you can choose as well. I saw someone said restroom, that's perfect. Restroom is very polite, it means exactly the same thing. You can just have a toilet and it's considered a restroom. Okay, you don't need a bath, you don't need a couch, you don't need a sink. Um, there's restroom, there's bathroom, there's um, uh, ladies room for women and um, 
boys room for guys. Uh, but really, I would say bathroom is by far the most common. Ah, yeah, water closet in the UK. Okay, well, I'm excited. Hopefully you guys can share with me about the, the WC. Uh, as you know, I'm bringing you my, my heavy American bias. So I'm letting you know how we say it. Oh, the loo. Someone put the loo, of course. If you ask for the loo in America, we will most likely be very charmed. And sometimes we might not understand. Okay, let's see. Next. How can we say this more politely? I don't like my food. Ah, and a quick interruption while you're writing. Washroom in Canada, that's true. In Canada, they call it the washroom. How are we going to say this, you guys? I don't like my food. How are we going to say it? I have some complaints. Sorry, the food isn't tasty. I don't think I can eat this. The food is tasteless. I'm not very hungry. Mm, interesting. I like this one. Food tastes weird. Could I have another dish? Can, can I change my food? Okay, it's quite spicy. Can I get another dish? It went too fast. I couldn't see who it was, but mm -hmm. I'm on a diet. That's funny. <laughs> Thank you, I'm full. Okay, I'd like to have some modification. I'm sorry, I was wondering. Okay, I see, I see people really going for the direct. I don't like my food. Honestly, I don't like my food. That's not very polite, you guys. We're, we're doing a little bit of avoidance here. Imagine that um, there's some reason you have to tell them, like you didn't finish, okay? So they're really asking you, but you're not submitting a complaint necessarily, all right? I might not, I have a family dinner. <laughs> Someone said the food is tasteless-ish. I don't think we can do that. Ish, by the way, we wouldn't put on a very long word like tasteless. This food is a bit cold. All right, let me show you what I had in mind. So when we are submitting a negative uh, review, unless we want to submit a complaint, if we want to complain, we say it differently. Okay, there's more honesty in a complaint. You're giving your feedback. But imagine a scenario where you're at a dinner with a lot of tourists, everyone loved the food. They loved it, they loved it, they loved it. And maybe it's cultural. You don't like the food, you're not used to this, they're eating with different utensils, you feel uncomfortable, and you don't wanna go into a big story of why you don't like it. There's basically two suggestions I have to make this a very polite response. Number one is to say a reason that is very softened, okay? We don't say, this food is tasteless. Everyone else just ate it, okay? That's actually quite rude. If I criticize the food that you're eating, I say the food has a quality that is bad. That is not polite, okay? So we always make it about us. This food is a bit too spicy for me, okay? Not for everyone, for me. So it's not uncomfortable if someone else enjoyed it. If it's not spicy, pick salty. If it's not salty, you can say, I'm not eating very much meat these days. I think it's too much meat for me, okay? And maybe you say, ah, I didn't realize they'd use this one spice cardamom. I really just like cardamom, shoot, okay? But you always make it about yourself and your own preferences. And then use something that's not so strong. Instead of, it's way spicy, I hate spice. You say, it's a bit too spicy, all right? We soften it when we want to say something and remain polite, okay? We don't make it too assertive. We don't make a declaration about this. We just state enough to move on. Um, someone said, is spicy bad? No, the only reason we know that this is a negative statement is the word too. It is too spicy. You may be someone who loves spice, but this one is actually, even though I love spice, it's too spicy for me, okay? Too is negative. When something is too spicy, too salty, too sweet, it means it's beyond what I like, okay? Another one that you can say is, this isn't agreeing with me. 
What does it mean when you say it isn't agreeing with me? Who knows what that means? Very polite. It's a very polite statement. And sometimes if you haven't encountered it, you might actually be confused. Doesn't suit me. I'm not fond. No, that's not what it means. Not pleased. No, it doesn't fit me. No. Someone said, I have an allergy. That's the close. Ah, someone says it doesn't settle well with me. When something undigestible, very good. When something doesn't agree with you, it means you're not digesting it well. So maybe you start eating and then you go, mm, it's not agreeing with me. I don't know why. Okay, maybe I'm just tired or something, but I'm not digesting it well. It's not about preference. Okay, it is not about preference. I may love this food and I love the taste, but it's hurting my stomach. Okay, so it's a very, very polite way to say this is actually really hurting my stomach. I can't keep eating it. And it's a great way to end the conversation if you don't want to explain why you don't like the food. Oh, bummer. It's not agreeing with me. Okay. All right. I think we have time. Let me check the time. Uh, because I see we have Nora here. We're going to do one more. Okay. I want to change my seat. How do we say this more politely? You can imagine you're in an airplane or you can imagine you're in a restaurant. May I change the seat, please? I would like to look for another seat. I like that. We avoided that present simple. Is it possible to have another seat? Can I have, okay, that's not exactly. Could you change? I would prefer, okay. I was wondering, is it possible? Oh, good, you guys. I love the, is it a possibility? This is a really very polite way to ask. May I change, please? The seat is uncomfortable. Okay, giving a reason. May I change? Could I change? Okay, I was wondering if it's possible to slightly move to another seat. I saw someone uh, in the quick, because you guys are submitting so many things. I saw someone said, is it possible to slightly change to another seat? I just have to say that that's not a very logical sentence because you either are in one seat or you're in another seat. You're not slightly in another seat. Slightly in the seat would mean I'm just a little bit of my body is in one seat. So I admire the effort and whoever submitted that, thank you for noticing the words I gave you to make it more polite. But we also have to make sure that they're very, um, they actually still make sense. Okay, these are my answers. Would it be possible to change seats? So yes, to everyone who came in with the possibility questions, that's one of my favorite recommendations for making something polite. When you say, would it be possible? It's clear that I want to change seats. There's no, there's no lack of clarity, but it just makes it easier for the stewardess or for the restaurant to say, unfortunately, it's not possible. Okay, you leave the situation open, which makes it more polite and maybe makes it more likely they will say yes. And then another one is, I'm not loving this location. Could I move a bit towards the front? Okay. So I changed it from, I don't like my seat to I'm not loving, okay? I'm not enjoying. When we make something a continuous, either present or past continuous, it is more polite. I was wondering, I was thinking, I'm, uh, I'm, questioning this decision or something like that. Okay. It's so this is a classic softener, meaning it makes it more polite. Okay. Make sure you put the ing. I'm not enjoying. I'm not loving. Okay. That's what keeps it polite. That's what keeps it continuous. Okay. Someone asked me to read the second sentence. I'll read it out loud. I'm not loving this location. Could I move a bit towards the front? This one, of course, I'm thinking of, uh, of an airplane. Ooh, okay, I was hoping you guys would ask me this. Someone said, can we put love in the continuous? In polite scenarios, polite formulas, you can. 
it's one of the very few situations where this is acceptable. I know you guys have been in your English classes and we've said, there are some verbs you can never put as a gerund, as a, as a continuous ing. Okay, but in a politeness scenario, we accept this and it actually makes the situation more polite. All right. I was wondering if would, someone would point that out and I'm happy you guys caught it. All right. So common misconceptions and then we are gonna welcome Miss Noor to join us. So I don't know if you guys are thinking this, but a lot of people do think this when I teach them about polite English, which as we talked about, politeness is very important for travel and tourism. When I talk about polite English, people say, Ariella, if I'm that indirect or if my phrase is that nice, people are going to think they can walk all over me. They won't uh, take me seriously. They, they'll think I have no pride. Okay. Tonight, I didn't see that in the discussion, but every other time I've taught this, people come back to me saying, I can't say that. I sound like I have no confidence, like I don't know what I want. Okay, and I'm here to correct that misconception. Polite, indirect English is what's called a code, okay? When I say to you, I was wondering if I could move to the front of the plane, the code is the sentence. The meaning is, I wanna move. And everybody knows the meaning. The stewardess on the airplane, she knows I want to move. She hears the meaning behind it, okay? If I go to a restaurant and I say, um, do, you have re uh, do you have a restroom? They know I'm not just curious about the restroom. They hear the polite code, okay? The code of, is there a restroom here? Or do you have a restroom? Is I want to use it. Can I use it? Okay, so you are learning the codes so that everyone around you knows that you are a polite person and gives you positive responses, okay? So here are the misconceptions I want to correct. Number one, softeners do not make you sound uncertain. They make you instead sound fluent in the codes of English. They will make it sound like your English is a higher level. Number two, softeners do not make you sound weak. They make you sound confident, okay? Because when we understand the codes, we are more confident. I know directly how to communicate my request, so I say it with confidence. Just because it says ish <laughs> or slightly does not mean I have full confidence in what I'm saying, okay? And last of all, softeners are not only for responding to complaints or dealing with a negative situation. We use them for all polite interactions. <laughs>